I love Australia. It's one of my favourite places. Do you know, sometimes it just feels amazing to be alive in a wild place like this. In this series, I'll be exploring six of Australia's unique landscapes. Join me as I travel through spectacular tracts of wilderness, from the red sands of the desert to the tropical waters of the Great Barrier Reef, from the wetland floodplains it's big, dangerous. To the dark heart of the rainforest. It makes you feel very small and insignificant when you're standing next to a buttress root like this. On the trail of the weird and wonderful animals found here and nowhere else. Oh, that's a great bridge. Wasn't that beautiful? For a naturalist, this is one of the most inspirational places to visit on our entire planet as I set out on an epic adventure into wild Australia. <laughs> in search of some of the most unique animals in the world, I'm flying over 9,000 miles to the remote wilderness regions of Australia. For anyone interested in nature, stepping onto Australian soil is like stepping into the shoes of an 18th century naturalist. Everything here is strange and different, and that's because this continent has largely evolved in isolation. And what a vast and varied landscape it is too. My first stop is at the northeastern edge of Queensland, where I'll be delving into the coastal waters that are home to the largest living structure on Earth, the Great Barrier Reef. It's a marine adventure that promises humpback whales, giant turtles, and an abundance of exotic fish and birds. I'm starting on the mainland in Harvey Bay. It may look like a grey day in Cromer, but the climate here is warm all year round, never dropping below 22 degrees Celsius. I'm really looking forward to today. We're heading out to Harvey Bay that's the harbour entrance here. Up north of me stretches the Great Barrier Reef. And over to my east, that's Fraser Island. That's the largest sand island on the planet. Fascinating place. And that actually provides protection to the bay from the southern part of the Pacific Ocean. And as a consequence, this sheltered area is an extremely good place to look for wildlife. So uh, it should be an exciting day. This is one of the best places in the world to find humpback whales. Every year, these humpbacks make an extraordinary 5,000 kilometer migration from their tropical breeding area north of here to the feeding grounds in Antarctica. It's the longest migration made by any animal. On this arduous journey, the whales make just one stop, and that's here in Harvey Bay. With me is whale expert Wally Franklin, who's been studying the whales arriving here for over 25 years. With whales, it became an interest, turned into a passion, and became an obsession. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really glad that it has, because but these animals need champions, because they can't speak for themselves. Absolutely. With Wally's expert knowledge of these waters, we don't have to wait long for our first sighting. Here we go, here we go. And again. <laughs> We've spotted a mother whale with a very young calf, just three months old. Uh -huh. That's mum. That's mum, yeah. What so, a lovely sight. Humpbacks get their name from the raised hump of the dorsal fin and because they arch their backs when they dive. <laughs> That's amazing. So tell me what's special about Harvey Bay. Well, Harvey Bay is an absolutely unique location for humpback whales. Mature females discovered this area 
and realised it was a perfect location to bring their slightly older calves, right? But when they start travelling is when they begin coming in here. This sheltered bay makes the perfect location for swimming lessons. What a privileged view we've got. Humpbacks are the show-offs of the whale kingdom. Oh, she's really playful. Look at that. The clowns who love messing around at the surface of the water. This young female calf is enjoying practicing important skills like breaching, tail lobbing, and pectoral slapping, which you'll need on her long journey to Antarctica. A very typical calf play, this. That's amazing. She's on her back doing this. And you can clearly see the lumps, the tubercles on the, the leading edge there of the pectoral fins. Amazing. Very distinctive, aren't they? Easy to identify because of the, the length of the, the pectoral fins. They're, they're the only whale with pectoral fins that are relatively the same length of our arms to our bodies. All the other whales and dolphins have pectoral fins that are only about elbow short, length. Yes. Mm. Why do they uh, back, why do they pectoral slap like that, Sir Wally? Are they using it to communicate? There's a belief that the peck slapping is, uh, has a communication function. Uh, there's a view that the peck slapping uh, gives other whales an indication of their presence, may, may be a way of for a female to call in males, they say. But with the mums and calves, the, um, very likely she's in a process of training the calf how to do it. Okay. Remember, the calves have got to learn everything. They All the moves, all the whale moves, come from working with mum. So what happens is, whoa, there's a nice That's a great bridge. bridge. Oh, isn't that beautiful? It's all about this young whale getting full control of its body, coordination of its movements, and, and also learning the moves. I mean, that breach could save its life one day. This calf will be extremely vulnerable on her very first migration. She could fall prey to sharks or killer whales, or even die of exhaustion. These lessons are vital to her survival. This is the kindergarten, the junior school, and the high school right, for the humpback okay. whales. Now when they leave here, they have to make their first trip to Antarctica and get safely back, and that's university. So by the end of their first year, these young whales have done all the study they need to do to live safely for the rest of their lives as a humpback whale. That's a really nice way of putting it. Looks like another blue gum dive. Look hey! <laughs> That's great. You, you love them, don't you? We absolutely love these whales, and uh, you know I can see we'll be devoting the rest of our lives to continuing to study them and to be a voice on their behalf as best we can. <laughs> That's great. Watching such a young calf master her whale moves has been a unique experience for me. It's like seeing a toddler take its first steps, and that's a very special moment to witness. Welcome aboard, Ray. Thank you. It's been an inspiring day, but my journey has only just begun as I head out to the Great Barrier Reef itself. The Great Barrier Reef is actually a long string of islands and submerged reefs, stretching for nearly two and a half thousand kilometres. I'm on my way to Lady Elliot Island, a typical Coral Cay island at the southernmost tip of the reef.
Lady Elliot first appeared above sea level 3,500 years ago. Like all Coral Cay Islands, it's made out of dead coral, shingle and sand that's built up very slowly on the reef below. And I can't wait to get underwater to see the marine life that thrives here. The dive team have brought me out to one of the main dive sites close to the shore. So here goes. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the most complex and diverse ecosystems on the planet. It's like an underwater city that never sleeps, with over 12,000 species of marine life coming and going. Like this green turtle, these giant creatures can weigh as much as 380 kilograms. That's heavier than a Harley Davidson motorbike. Yet they're so graceful in the water and can swim up to 20 miles per hour. They have a large shell called a carapace and a beak-like mouth with which they crush their food, although they mainly eat seagrass and algae. corals beneath me are living creatures, part of the jellyfish family, and they've attached themselves to submerged rocks around the perimeter of the island. There are more than 350 known species of corals on the Great Barrier Reef. These are beautiful staghorn corals. You can tell them by their tree-like branches. And these are big-eyed trevally fish. There must be over 1,500 in this slow-moving school. But there's one fish that I really want to see, the manta ray, one of the largest and most beautiful of all, and Lady Elliot is one of the best places in the world to see them. And there it is. What an elegant swimmer as it glides away from me. That was an incredibly healthy reef, in absolutely pristine condition. Brilliant. Oh, it's an amazing way to see the green world. Oh, that was incredible. But after my brief glimpse of a manta ray, I'm determined to get back into the water for a much closer look. I'm in northeastern Australia, exploring the amazing marine life of the Great Barrier Reef. This is Lady Elliot Island, at the most southerly tip of the reef. So far, I've only glimpsed the manta ray in one of the dives, but now they're feeding near the surface, so there's a great opportunity to snorkel with them. And when you're snorkeling, you're not producing bubbles. That makes you less uh, scary to the mantas and gives us much better opportunities to get close. So fingers crossed, eh? Marine biologist Maggie O'Neill is going to be snorkeling with me. They're just in front of you there. Don't chase them. Manta rays are the gentle giants of the reef. They're not aggressive and don't have a stinging barb. They also have the largest brain to body size of any living fish. I can't believe how close I'm able to get and as a manta ray dives underneath me, I follow it down. I have to go back to the surface to breathe, but this manta ray seems curious and comes back to have a look at me. Manta rays are known to be inquisitive and often interact with divers. These huge fish have a wingspan from tip to tip of up to seven meters, but they're feeding on the ocean's smallest creatures, microscopic zooplankton. I'm in the middle of a feeding frenzy as large numbers of manta rays 
have gathered here to feast. They hold their giant mouths open and use their front lobes to funnel the plankton inside. This is known as ram feeding, when the manta swims against the current with an open mouth. It's an extraordinary sight. Oh, Maggie, that was amazing. What an incredible snorkel that was. It's absolutely amazing, wasn't it? It is quite unique to see them in big groups like that, but if there's lots of food around, you will see that happening. Oh, it was amazing because at one point I went down and followed one. And as I came up, I was surrounded by manta rays. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Everywhere you look, they're all around you. There's a real sense of an intelligence that there's a, a, a brain functioning. How large is their brain? Their brain is comparable to a marine mammal in its size. So incredibly intelligent animals. And you will see them interact with snorkelers and divers. We've had ones which have come in, which have had a hook or a bit of line attached to them. And they'll hang around a diver and they'll actually let the diver remove all of that line and that hook from their body. And then they seem to hang around as if to show thanks for That's that whole... Amazing situation yeah I mean it really is one of those moments when you feel like you're you're meeting another sentient being of the sea yeah it? you can really connect with them you can see them looking at you and they're really really intelligent amazing they're beautiful creatures but it's not just the marine life that depends on the reef this island really belongs to the birds they're everywhere the noise is deafening Isolated islands like Lady Elliot make the perfect nesting ground for seabirds. Over 200 species of birds are found on the Great Barrier Reef, and many of them nest here, like this chick of the rare red-tailed tropic bird. And these bridal terns and sooty oyster catchers. Birds play a major role in the development of a coral cay island like this one. In fact, you could say that their droppings or guano is the most valuable commodity on the island. You can see here that the island is comprised of dead coral. And that is a very unpromising ground for plants to take hold in. It takes real specialists to take a toehold here. Plants like this, this is the octopus bush. It gets its name from that strange shaped flower stalk there. Now, octopus bushes can cope not only with the difficult soil conditions, but also with the salt atmosphere here. And that also provides a habitat for birds. And the guano from those birds, combined with the leaf mold from these bushes, is the beginnings of a soil that other plants will exploit later on. This is, this is a black noddy, and you can see the nest is literally just leaves glued together with guano. Precarious. Noddies are so named because they nod their heads repeatedly while courting. Seeing so many trees, it's hard to believe that in the 19th century, this island's vegetation was virtually destroyed by miners digging for bird droppings or guano, which was prized as a fertilizer and used in gunpowder. Over the last 10 years, a team of passionate conservationists have been restoring the island's trees. I'm playing a small part in the work by helping my dive buddy, marine biologist Maggie O'Neill, planting a pisonia tree. And this is one of the worst soils I've ever dug up. It's like concrete. So all of these trees you're planting come from your cuttings from your own nursery, don't they? Exactly, yes. Yeah. So they come from the original trees that were here and weren't removed from the island. When the guano mining took place, they took like two metres of soil off, didn't they? Yeah, almost two metres. Now we're just dealing with a lot of rock. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? It is. But it's not uh, an easy job. <laughs> what, what is astonishing is how fast the... Um, trees have started to regenerate. Yeah, most definitely. And of course the trees create habitat for the birds and the birds bring their guano with them. Exactly, so it all needs to work together to make this unique place that we have here. And as you can see, the noddies all around us are loving it. I reckon we're almost there, right? Hey, we're putting up some more habitat <laughs> for you. 
think they're supervising. So this is a Personia. Yeah. And tell me about the tree. Why is it important on the island? All those white cap noddies really rely on these trees to nest in, but also the leaf litter is their favoured nesting material. And then in return, they're spreading the seeds that these trees produce. So these ones here, as they develop, they actually become really dark and sticky. So with the birds all nesting in through the trees, they're gonna get these seeds stuck to them. They can transport them around the place. But then also you might've seen the birds doing a sunbathing behavior yep. where they've got their wings crossed over. Because they're so sticky, their wings do get stuck together. And what happens is that bird can't fly, it can't feed. And that's like a little blood and bone packet oh for that goodness. tree to then grow. Like so, so because the sticky seeds glue the bird's wings together, it dies. Then its corpse provides all the nutrients the Personia needs to grow. Na nature does have a dark side sometimes. It does, doesn't it? Yes, it's one of those natural processes that does need to happen. And one happy tree. That's great. 20 years time. You'll be back. It'll be a tall tree. <laughs> yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? To, it does. To do something like that. 20 years time, you'll be having a whole heap of birds in it as well. It's amazing. <laughs> The huge numbers of birds already nesting on the island stand in testimony to the success of the conservation efforts being made here. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the largest assemblies of wildlife to be found on our planet. It truly is one of the great natural wonders of the world. I'm encouraged by the care being shown for this unique environment. It gives me hope that the reef will be preserved and protected for future generations. Next time, I'll be exploring the wetlands on the trail of one of Australia's most fearsome creatures.